I'd like to talk about how the apparent need for many nutrients is really a need created by disruptions of bowel flora and by choosing the wrong foods in your diet. With regards to B vitamins in particular, vitamin B1, B2, riboflavin, uh, B6, B9, that's folate, folic acid, uh, and B12, those B vitamins are actually produced in substantial quantities by bowel flora. Well, there's a problem. Many people who are overweight or obese, for instance, have a proliferation of formicutes. And formicutes typically do not produce B vitamins. In other words, people who are overweight or obese have a lack of bacterial species that produce B vitamins. And that may create a need for B vitamins. In other words, you may take exogenous, that is, B vitamin supplementation that seems to provide a benefit, but the real problem is disruption of the bowel flora. This also occurs in SIBO. The species that proliferate, the enterobacteriaceae in SIBO, also don't produce B vitamins. So an apparent benefit or need for a B vitamin or a deficiency in any of those B vitamins can really signal disrupted bowel flora, such as SIBO. Now, uh, you may have had a homocysteine level drawn uh, at one time or another. Homocysteine we know to be a very confident marker for greater risk for heart disease, heart attack, cancer, and depression. So levels of 14 micromolar or greater have been associated with typically a tripling, a threefold increase for heart attack, heart disease, cancer, and depression. And we know that you can reduce homocysteine levels with vitamins B6, B12, folate, and sometimes riboflavin is added, B2. Well, there are now eight clinical trials, very well constructed ones, by the way, in which B vitamins have been given to reduce homocysteine. Different doses and different studies, of course, but typically homocysteine levels are reduced successfully 25%, with no reduction in cardiovascular events, heart attack, or stroke. So there's something wrong here, right? Homocysteine, yes, is a good marker for increased risk, but it seems to be somehow disconnected uh, uh, to, to addressing that risk if you, if you reduce homocysteine. Well, think about that. What are the B vitamins produced at, in greatest quantity by bowel flora bacterial species? B6, B12, folate, and riboflavin. So could homocysteine really be a marker for dysbiosis? or SIBO. I think it is. That science is still very uh, uh, sketchy, so I can't tell you that for a fact, but my suspicion is that for all the years we've been agonizing over homocysteine, what it means, how to reduce it, etc., I think it's really simply a reflection of dysbiosis and SIBO, and that the real solution is not taking B vitamins, but addressing the dysbiosis or the SIBO. Another nutrient produced by bacteria is K2. K2 is produced from K1. So it's K1 from green vegetables like spinach and kale and broccoli that some bacterial species can convert to K2. So if there's an apparent benefit to taking K2, why would that be? Could it simply reflect the fact that there's some disruption of your bowel flora? Let's assume you're taking insufficient K1. But could there be a disruption of the conversion, bacterial conversion of K1 to K2? Uh, and the benefits would include uh, preservation of bone health, and perhaps reduction in cardiovascular risk, though that's, that data is very weak right now. Nonetheless, uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a catalog of all the species that could be missing that would have been responsible for K1 to K2 conversion. There's only a, the list is short right now. It's not quite clear how we restore those bacteria, but stay tuned to this conversation. I predict that sometime soon, as the science unfolds, that the apparent need for K2 can be corrected by addressing bowel flora, perhaps by restoring one or more keystone bacterial species or specific species that convert K1 to K2 that you may lack. And then lastly, diet can be very crucial in restoring nutrients, but typically not in the way you think. So you've been told you must eat wheat and grains, for instance, right, for their B vitamins and for their fiber. But another aspect of this is that wheat and related grains have something called phytates. And phytates have been enriched in modern wheat and grains because phytates are effective uh, against pests, pests that typically consume or infect the wheat plant. So farmers have selected strains of wheat that have greater phytate content for better pest resistance. But phytates are also very potent binders of all positively charged minerals. 
like calcium, magnesium, manganese, zinc, and iron. So when you ingest anything made of wheat and related grains, it binds all those minerals and you pass it out in the toilet. So one of the most glaring examples of this are ladies, for some, for some unclear reason, it's mostly a problem for females. Ladies who consume grains will develop iron deficiency anemia that is not responsive to iron supplementation. And so these ladies often get iron injections or even blood cell transfusions. They go through bone marrow biopsies, all kinds of uh, uh, awful things they have to go through. But they have normal uh, hemoglobin, a reversal of anemia with removal of all grains. That's one example of how bad things can get when you consume wheat and grains and block absorption of minerals. Now, if you're interested in these sorts of conversations, I invite you to catch up with us and join our program. The basic program, the basic prescriptive program, is best laid out in my newest book, which is the Wheat Belly Revised and Expanded Edition. That lays out the entire prescriptive program and kind of uh, summarizes all the lessons we've learned over the last nine years or so since the Wheat Belly program has come out. If you think you have a substantial disruption of your bowel flora, which is very common, or SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I invite you to join my conversations in my undoctored inner circle where we dive deeply into these, into these questions.